that it was within God's purposes that the Jewish people should have a home. There are some, of course, who will say that God has finished with Israel. Wars and rumors of wars. These are the birth pains of global change. In doing so, they opened the way for the restoration of the Jewish people to their ancient homeland. Did God reject his people? By no means. Romans 11, verse 1. That the destiny of Britain was actually to be the restorer of Israel, the Cyrus nation and the sovereign purposes of God. Prepare your hearts to receive the blessing of the Cyrus call. Shalom and welcome to another edition of Crosstalk. Today, we're going to present some fascinating information about the historical events that declare the signs of the times. And we're also going to describe some of the errors that have been caused by misunderstanding those signs. Let's explore events to deepen our knowledge about God's heart toward Israel. Do you love Israel? Do you care about the Jewish people? Do you count yourself to be among those believers in the Jewish Messiah whose hearts are turned toward Jerusalem in love? If so, this series will bring new understanding about the restoration of the Jewish people to the land of promise. This inspirational and educational television series has been prepared in partnership with the Hatikva Film Trust. Our goal is to share the story of how the Jewish people came back to the land of Israel, and the impact Christians have had on this prophetic journey. Join us now as we pursue the Cyrus Call. At the end of the 18th century, the Restorationist vision gained a new impetus. Many books were written on the subject. 1792, James Bichena, a Baptist minister, produces a pamphlet entitled The Signs of the Times trying to make sense of what is going on in the world, specifically in Europe, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, which broke out in 1789. Seven years later, he writes another pamphlet, The Restoration of the Jews, in which he says that the promised restoration of the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth had not been fulfilled when the Lord brought them back from Babylon, when only 42,000 Jews returned to the land. Bisheno and men like George Stanley Faber, James Hatley Frere were turning to the Word of God. They were turning to the books of Daniel, Revelation, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all the prophets, predicting that these events, tumultuous events that were taking place in Europe were signs, perhaps the signs that the Lord Jesus Christ himself gave to his, his disciples, that his return was imminent and also that the restoration of the Jews was at hand. However, the interest in Israel's restoration also led to the emergence of some bizarre ideas and personalities. Richard Brothers, who saw himself as a messianic figure, was among those who introduced a false teaching that later became known as British Israelism. In 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte invaded the Holy Land as a springboard for taking over Britain's Eastern Empire, especially India. After the defeat of a large Turkish army near Nazareth, Napoleon supposedly issued a proclamation calling upon the Jewish people to return to their homeland. He issued an address to the Jews, the Ottoman Jews, but if he joined him and helped him, he will proclaim and build a Jewish state. It was the first time that from a Gentile, these words were actually omitted. Jews were loyal to Turkey and didn't follow up, fortunately for them. Although the manuscript of this proclamation was never found, news of it was heard back in Britain. Many Christians saw this as a sign that France was being singled out as the modern Cyrus, who would lead the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. But this was not to be. A combined British-Turkish force defeated the French here at Arco in May 1799, and the French were forced to withdraw 
first to Egypt, then in time to France. The geopolitical rivalry with France at the end of the 18th century coincided with the Evangelical Christian Revival in Britain, which also coincided with the expansion of British influence across the world. And as the empire expanded, so did the desire of many British Christians to take the gospel of Jesus the Messiah to the ends of the earth. Could it be that Christians were being prepared by God to pave the way for the Jews to be restored to their promised homeland? Is there a connection between the rise of influence by evangelical Christians around the world and the church's growing desire to bless Israel and to help the Jews return? Let's look at history and consider the Cyrus Call. The turn from the 18th to the 19th century saw the establishment of many major Christian missions. In 1809, a Jewish believer in Jesus, Joseph Frey, established the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. The London Jew Society for short. This later became known as the Church's Ministry Among Jewish People, or CMJ. Among the society's founding vice presidents was William Wilberforce. In 1815, it became an Anglican-based society, with Charles Simeon, who was the vicar of Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge and a leading evangelical, playing a major role. Charles Simeon was essentially a Bible man, and therefore his concern was for the spread of biblical teaching throughout the church. And that meant not only uh, spreading the gospel in missionary service to other parts of the world, and for that reason he was involved in the foundation of the Church Missionary Society, and also for the London Jews Society, and also for the British and Foreign Bible Society. So he was one of the centre people in the great exp missionary expansion of the 19th century. His particular concern for the Jews was essentially because he held to what the Bible held. His own sermons, 2,500 of them, all printed up, uh, are available, and I've got one of them here, at least one of the books of sermons. There are 20 more books like this in the vestry here of this church. And there you'll see something of his heart for the Jewish people. Not only for the Jewish people, but that was an essential part of biblical teaching. And so he says the reason that he appeals to the church of his day to remember the Jews is because God loved them. He quotes, see how wonderfully God speaks about the Jewish people. He calls them the dearly beloved of my soul. He says, I will plant them in their own land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. And again, he says, he will rejoice over them with joy and they shall be a name and a praise among all the people of the earth. Now that's a quotation from one of his very last sermons when he was almost given his dying wish to the church to say what he really feels. So his longing and his love for the Jews was unique and it influenced not only him but a couple of generations of people after him. It is clear how godly church leaders and Bible-believing Christians should relate to the Jewish people. Stay tuned to learn what happens when God's people get their hearts right toward Israel. Prepare your heart for the Cyrus Call. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus shares a parable about sowing seed on good ground where it can produce crop that can yield 30, 60, and even 100 times the amount that was sown. As stewards of what God entrusts us with, we're responsible to sow into good ground that produces a good crop. In the business world, we call this a good ROI, or return on investment. I want to ask you to prayerfully consider making a good investment into the ministry outreach of Crosstalk International. The ROI is evidence that the Lord is doing some great things through this ministry. Several years back, our supporters made it possible for us to build a brand new leprosy clinic in the heart of Orissa, India. Every single month, Crosstalk provides all of the food and medicine that is needed for that ongoing clinic, serving dozens of leper patients. Last year, 
we took on the responsibility to provide food and housing for the children of those leper patients in an effort to help stop the ongoing spread of leprosy to their children. We have 20 different native missionaries that are on the ground throughout the 1040 window, speaking the language of their people and evangelizing the lost as their full-time occupation. Many of them have already planted churches and are moving on to plant new churches, but we're needing support. Our annual missions budget is only reached through the generosity of our supporters. Right now, we need to raise $11,000 for our leprosy outreach, $7,200 for our native missionaries, $8,600 for our Cuba outreach, and we need to raise money to complete the production of the next series of Today with God, featuring the Gospel of Luke. Your generous monthly support or one-time gift, it will sow vital seeds on good ground and reap a fruitful harvest. Thank you for your consideration to invest in the ministry outreach of Crosstalk International. All checks and gifts should be made payable to Crosstalk Missions. I can assure you that the ROI of your investment will be one that the Lord is happy with. Biblical prophecy and the involvement of the church in end time issues is a very hot topic. The subject is not new, and we want all believers to have a more informed grasp on the subject. The Cyrus Call is for you. Along with William Wilberforce and Charles Simeon, one of CMJ's most active members was a wealthy man by the name of Lewis Way. The connection between men like Lewis Way, William Wilberforce, Charles Simeon, was that they had the same understanding of the Word of God. They believed in the inspiration of the Scriptures, they believed in the literal fulfillment of prophecy, and within that, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the restoration of the Jews to the land. Charles Simeon, William Wilberforce, aided Lewis Way when he founded the training park for missionaries at Stansted Park in the early 1800s. Lewis Way's involvement with CMJ was quite unusual. In 1804, he received over 300,000 pounds as a bequeath to be used for the glory of God, and yet he didn't know how to use it. In 1812, while traveling between Exeter and Exmouth, he noticed a very interesting building known as A La Ronde. This building was built by two ladies, Mary and Jean Parmenter, who had a very interesting vision that one day in the future, the message of Jesus would go back to the Jewish people and the Jewish people would return to the land of Israel. Way thought this was a very interesting point in view, which in actual fact is the name of this chapel, which the Parmenter ladies built very nearby to Alaron. So thereafter, Lewis Way invested his energies and his resources to further this cause and became involved with CMJ. In 1818, Louis Way travels to Aix la Chapelle. This is the scene of the Conference of Nations, the powerful nations of Europe in that time, Russia, Prussia, Austria, France, Britain, who are deciding in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars what is to be done with Europe, how is it to be apportioned among the great powers. What is remarkable is that Louis Way engages in discussions on biblical prophecy with the Tsar, and the Tsar encourages Lewis Way to present his memorial to the powers like Metternich, Richelieu, Wellington, who are assembled at Aix la Chapelle. Lewis Way explains to them how important it is that the nations of Europe grant toleration and emancipation, freedom, civil liberties to the Jews who have been oppressed for so long but he also explains the significance biblically of the Jewish people, especially in the context of the Lord's return, the Messiah returning to rule and reign from Jerusalem. Lewis Way was by no means isolated in his desire to see the restoration of Israel. What was happening in the early 19th century is that men like Bushano, Frere, Stanley Faber, Lewis Way were writing on biblical prophecy but they were coming together. They were starting to come together. A network was forming of Christians who believed in the literal fulfillment of God's word. One man who joined that network 
was a man by the name of Henry Drummond, a wealthy banker, landowner, member of parliament, who in 1819 purchased Albury Park. In 1826, Lewis Way, Henry Drummond, James Hatley Frere formed the Society for the Investigation of Prophecy. Beginning in November 1826, a series of conferences is convened here at Albury Park in this very room, underneath the chandelier where we are sat today, in which Drummond, who is the host, Hugh McNeil, the chair, invite the leading clergymen and laymen of that period who are writing about biblical prophecy, men such as Edward Irving, William Millennial Marsh, William Cunningham. These are the leading prophetic expositors of their time. And Drummond invites them to his mansion because he believes these are the men that have not given up their belief in one, the literal return of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his reign upon the earth, and two, the literal fulfillment of all the prophecies God gave concerning the restoration of the Jewish people. By 1814, the London Jew Society had constructed a large complex in London known as Palestine Place. The Society's patron then was the Duke of Kent, father to Queen Victoria. With a strong presence now established in Great Britain and Europe, the next objectives Lewis Way and the London Jew Society, or CMJ, had was to do the same in the land of Israel. This would prove to be another historic beginning. CMJ was the pioneer British institution to attempt to establish a solid bridgehead in Jerusalem in the 1820s. The goal was, officially, to introduce Jesus as Messiah to the Jewish people, and also unofficially, to prepare for the restoration of Israel. However, the ruling Ottoman Turks refused to allow foreigners, and especially Protestants, to reside in the land of Israel. Moreover, Islamic law prohibited the building of any new churches. The pioneer CMJ workers who came here actually stated that two things had to happen before Protestant Christianity could be established in Jerusalem. Firstly, there had to be a change in government, and secondly, there had to be a British consul stationed in Jerusalem. In the 1830s, both of these objectives were fulfilled. For those who say that politics and religion don't mix, they simply don't understand either, and they must certainly ignore history. Let's not do that. Stay tuned for more of The Cyrus Call. Check out the all-new IBM television. My God is here. Follow the move by tuning in as we partner with ministries like Greg Laurie and Harvest America. Serving our audience 24 hours a day, IBN broadcasts on 52 television stations around the country and on popular streaming apps like Roku, Apple TV, Android, and many others. With one purpose, to share the move of our living God with the dying world on a daily basis. IBN Television. What if I told you that for the cost of a couple of cups of coffee, you can present the gospel message to hundreds of people across the island of Cuba. That type of impact is hard to find anywhere in the world. But that's exactly what's possible with the Today With God project. You see, every flash drive that we bring down gets given to a pastor who will then use it across the island in door-to-door -door evangelism, in roadside evangelism, in church ministry, in Sunday school, in seminary. One flash drive. It's incredible what God can do. By skipping a cup of coffee just a couple of times a month, you can provide one flash drive that will get used across the island with hundreds of Cubans where the gospel message is presented. All it takes is $10. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422 or visit us online at crosstalk.org. To those who suggest the Jews do not belong in Israel, they know little about history or the Bible. The Cyrus call to people of the nations is real. 
In 1831, a long-running dispute between Egypt to the south and the Ottoman Turks in the north resulted in the Egyptians under the leadership of Mehmet Ali invading the land of Israel and ousting the Turks. Mehmet Ali permitted British subjects to reside in Jerusalem. As a result, in 1833, a CMJ worker, Danish-born John Nicolaysen, became the first Protestant Christian to live permanently in Jerusalem. Nicolaysen's task was to establish CMJ's mission base with the ultimate aim of establishing a Protestant church there. By the 1830s, CMJ had some very influential evangelical Christians running it. The society's president was Sir Thomas Baring, a former Chancellor of the Exchequer. CMJ's chief spokesman was Anthony Ashley, later Lord Shaftesbury, who was related to the Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston. Palmerston was desirous of thwarting any attempted French or Russian incursion into the region of the Middle East. The French were the official protectors of all Catholics in the region and the Russians were the protectors of the Orthodox Christians. Hence, both of these powers had a distinct advantage over the British. The only British subjects to whom Britain could offer protection were the CMJ missionaries. So with these two considerations in mind, to protect the British subjects and to monitor French and Russian operations in the region, Palmerston decided in 1838 to establish a British consulate in Jerusalem. At the beginning of 1839, Britain's first consul, William Tanner Young, arrived in Jerusalem. Along with the handful of Protestants residing in the Holy City, he was instructed to protect the Jews, who by now accounted for nearly half of the city's population. In addition, throughout the period of the dispersion, Jews had lived in small communities scattered across the land, in places like Safed, Tiberias, and Hebron, the oldest Jewish community in the world. Soon after he arrived in Jerusalem, Consul Young wrote to the British government. There are two parties here who will doubtless have some voice in the future disposition of affairs. The one is the Jew, and to whom God originally gave this land as a possession, and the other, the Protestant Christian, his legitimate offspring. Of both these, Great Britain seems the natural guardian. The establishment of the British consulate in Jerusalem was to have its desired impact. The importance of uh, establishing a consul was because at uh, that time the British consul was also the protector of the Jewish uh, subjects uh, in the country, in the land. And it uh, really have seen that the rights that have been given, that they would be practiced almost in full order. Palmerston himself was a great liberal, uh, sensitive to people who were oppressed persecuted, among them also the Jews. And when the vice consulate in Jerusalem was established in 1839, the instruction was to protect the Jews in generally. Now, in generally, in a wider sense, it means not only those who are foreign nationals, but also the local, the native Jews. And whenever uh, somebody was persecuted, even in the Ottoman Empire, although he might have been of Ottoman nationality, Palmerston immediately raised his voice and interfered. Within a couple of decades, every major European power, as well as the Americans, would follow suit and establish consulates here in Jerusalem. The land of Israel was beginning to emerge from centuries of political obscurity. That same year, 1838, CMJ managed to procure land inside the Jaffa Gate near to the British consular residence. Situated right opposite the citadel that the Romans had preserved in 70 of the Common Era, this became the first piece of Protestant real estate in the land of Israel, even the Middle East. 
it was clear from this point forward that Britain's official policy in the land of Israel was going to be intertwined with the Jewish people. Britain's Cyrus role to pave the way for the restoration of the Jews to the Promised Land had begun. The Cyrus call was never limited to drawing England into the work of God. And the Cyrus call continues. God made a promise to restore the land and his people to the land. In 1839, the Scottish evangelicals joined in. In June that year, a delegation led by the Reverend Robert Murray McShane visited the Promised Land and the Holy City, which, as the Bible had prophesied, had been suffering from centuries of neglect. His journal gives us a vivid picture of the character of Jerusalem at that time. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? Is this the perfection of beauty? How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? It is indeed very desolate. Read the two first chapters of Lamentations and you will have a vivid picture of our first sight of Jerusalem. I think I'd better not tell you about Jerusalem. The plague is still in Jerusalem. Every night we heard the mourners going about the streets with their dismal wailings for the dead. Zion is ploughed like a field, just as in Micah chapter 3 verse 12. Jerusalem is indeed heaps of ruins. The quantities of rubbish would amaze you in one place higher than the walls. Judah's cities are all waste. Upon his return to Scotland, McShane stated in a sermon, The greatest glory and joy anyone can experience is to be like God. And to care first for the Jews is to be like God. The whole Bible shows that God has a special affection for Israel. There are some, of course, who will say that God has finished with Israel. But the whole Bible contradicts such an idea. Did God reject his people? By no means. Romans 11 verse 1. Do you agree? Does the Bible contradict the notion that God is done with the Jews? As a Jew, I hope not. And as a Christian, I invite you to come for our next episode to learn the truth and to pursue the Cyrus call. Till next time, shalom and God bless you. And God will bless all who love Israel. Because he loves me, I will follow him. Because he loves me, I will follow him. Because he loves me, because he loves me. Because he loves me, I will follow him. Because he loves me, 